response has been unprecedented. Hasn't it? School has been postponed. Again, Washington State in, in for like six weeks. So it's like an early summer break. And I, I guess they're going to maybe add on maybe two weeks, two, three weeks at the end of the year. But Washington State or uh, the Oregon State has a, a extended spring break. It was supposed to start not tomorrow, but next Monday. It's, it actually starts tomorrow and it goes through to the end of the month. So April 1st, we get a long extended spring break. Um, university students have been sent home, many of them, to take online classes. Uh, university students are uh, kind of up in the air. Don't know what's next. Sports have been shut down. Wow. The NBA has canceled their season. That has never, I, I don't know if that has ever happened. The NHL has canceled their season. The major leagues have postponed things. The NCAA tournament canceled, right? I, I think first there wasn't supposed to be any um, uh, public for fans, but now I think they've just called the whole thing off. Is that right? So March Madness is no more. Uh, flights have been canceled. Borders have been closed. Employees have been sent home. Woo, woo, woo. Right? Anybody happy about that? No? Why? Well, I mean, you can work from home, but yeah, some people have to go on a, 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 on a forced furlough. And so that, that is, uh, that's hard. And toilet paper has been sold out. It's crazy. I got a, a couple of slides here. I don't know if you've seen this. So I said to Arnie, where did you get those toilet rolls? He said, I'll be back. <laughs> and then the next slide here. I saw this on Facebook. Commemorative jewelry to always remember 2020 by. I mean, what, what's the deal with toilet paper? I think just because people are at the store, they figure, well, we should probably grab some toilet paper. But what's up with the 250 uh, person law or, or rule in the stores? Right? Costco. You have about a couple thousand in there. And it's just, it's just crazy. So people are buying up toilet paper left and right. Hand sanitizer sales have been up 800%. Wow. And the president has just declared a, a national emergency. $50 billion will be allocated to helping slow down the spread of COVID-19. But uh, national emergencies are nothing new. Uh, this has been done by every president since Gerald Ford, the last one being Barack Obama in 2009 with, this, with the swine flu. You guys remember that? 2009, H1N1. I think it ended up taking 12,000 lives. So to stem the tide, I think uh, the government, CDC, have been trying to put in things to, to ward off that ever happening again. So there's been this dramatic response. Uh, one thing that national emergencies do is cause uh, a bit of destabilization. Have you seen that? I mean, our society is destabilized right now. Everybody is so uncertain. Uh, the Dow jo Jones is teetering. All right, up and down, the economy is, is, is uncertain. People are starting to stockpile and to hoard. And obviously, it's the, there's been the talk of fear, right? Just everybody is, you know, very, very, very shaky, not knowing what's going to happen. But uh, as I was thinking about this, I, I, I think one of the benefits, perhaps, of, of what's happening right now is that we have... Um, with the dis destabilization, we have a chance to have the idols of our culture revealed. There's a lot of things that we put our hope in, our trust in, that, uh, that prop us up as a people that are being removed. That are usually not removed. And so we're, we're kind of shaky on our feet because all of a sudden we're, we're realizing we don't have those things to prop us up any longer. Uh, you, could, you can call it the idols of health. 
We put a lot of trust in our, in our medical system. Put a lot of trust in our, in our doctors. Put a lot of trust in our medicines. Not that health is a bad thing, but sometimes it can be, it can be put into the place of God. As long as we have our health, then we're fine. But once that is removed, or the uncertainty of that is removed, then what happens? Talk about the idols of security. We put a lot of trust in our stocks and bonds. Put a lot of trust in our future, our nest egg, our investments. When those are uncertain, all of a sudden we, begin, we get really panicky. That would be an idol. You can call it the idols of privilege. Because in America, we, we're not supposed to be treated like any other country. But sometimes we're, we're worse off in times like these than in third world countries. They don't enjoy the privilege that we have. But once that's threatened, then all of a sudden we, we become very fearful. Or you can call it the idols of convenience. What do you mean there's no more toilet paper? We want things at a snap of a finger. I mean, hey, you know. And so when things are no longer convenient, then all of a sudden we start asking the big questions. So when these things get threatened, health, security, privilege, and convenience, we get very shaky. Not that these things are bad or wrong, but they just get elevated to the place of God. And we look to these things more than we look to God. And they become an idol in our life and so if anything good is coming out of this it's the fact that it's revealing or uncovering the idols that we serve but i love uh, psalm 20 verse 7 and it puts it this way and i think this really should be our confession as as the people of god is that some trust in chariots some trust in horses but we, church, we trust in the name of the Lord, our God. There's nothing wrong with chariots. Nothing wrong with horses, right? We just can't put our trust in them. We can't put our ultimate trust in horses and chariots. So we use these things, but we don't serve these things. We don't trust these things. These are, these are not the, the instruments of our salvation. So we use medicine. We use precaution. We use sanitizer. But we don't put our trust in it. Not our ultimate trust, at least. Not like we do with God. But when we don't have God to lean on, when, when we look around us and people have not yet put their faith and trust in God, in Jesus, we can understand that when, when horses and chariots go away, what else is going to save us? And we get a very destabilized society. And that's what we're seeing all around us. And there has to be more in life than horses and chariots. There has to be more. There has to be more to life than the idols of convenience, of security, of safety. These things only provide us assistance and help, but they are not our source of salvation. So today I want to talk a little bit about confidence in God. He is our confidence. He, we don't put our confidence in God. He is our confidence. We don't put our trust in God. He is our trust. He is the very essence of salvation. And so today as we go into our time of prayer, I, 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 want, us to, I want us to call on the name of the Lord as a people, we don't need to get into groups, okay? I'm going to have uh, some various people come up here, and we're going to cover different topics and different items. But I'm going to ask you not to just rely on the person up here to call on the name of the Lord. I'm going to ask each and every person in their seats, because our salvation comes to no from nowhere else than from the Lord. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and are safe. 
So we're going we're gonna to call upon the name of the Lord. And we're going to lift up the name of the Lord. Because that's, that's where our salvation comes from. So we're going to give an opportunity for the church to be um, calling on the name of the Lord, lifting up the name of the Lord. Uh, but also, I want us to also consider um, these kinds of times that we're in right now are unique opportunities. They create doors of opportunity for us to be hands and feet to our community. Hands of Jesus and the feet of God carrying in the gospel and making a unique difference. Okay, so what kind of opportunity is going to be in front of us? I have no idea. But however, from this time, my prayer, as we headed in to, 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 to church this morning, my prayer is that, God, would you birth in our gathering time uh, some revelation, some understanding, some wisdom as to how we can move forward? Because there's going to be needs. And what I'm going to ask you to do as the people of God is to knock on your neighbor's doors. You know, we're, we're, we're a lot of us, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of, we, we have a pall that's falling over our city. It's like the universal sick day. Everybody's just, just you know, and that, that's good, but it, there is like, man, it's like desolate. And people already deal with loneliness. The, the thing I don't want to see happen is that the spirit of loneliness would seize a hold of people who already struggle with that. So yeah, we're supposed to avoid uh, mass gatherings, but that does not preclude us from, from being able to knock on a neighbor's door. Would you think about that? If we want to be hands and feet to our community, we can start by the next door neighbor. Just make a round. Knock on the door. Make sure they have some supplies. Do you, do you have everything that you need? Especially if you, if you have elderly that, uh, some of the vulnerable population, knock on their door. See if you can take them to a trip to, the medical, to, to their medical appointments or do they need to go to the store? Do you need to grab something for them? See about people, care for people in your community. And uh, what I'm saying is, is, is be a witness. We are the light of the world. If you have Jesus living on, on the inside of you, you are salt and you are light, and it's in times like these that we make the most difference. Do you know, if you, you, you know this, that when, when a light is shining in a light room, it makes hardly any difference at all. But you shut down the lights and that thing is like blaring. You can make a huge difference because it's, it's getting dark and it's getting hopeless and people are, are despairing and panicking and and. And not to dismiss the fear, but to make a difference. And so as light, I'm asking us to consider ways that we can be a witness of the name of the Lord, Jesus, God. And two ways I think we can do this is being a witness of peace in the midst of the storm and being a witness of love when everybody just draws back. So be a witness of peace, which is really just a synonym for confidence. Where do you find your confidence in? Is it with the stuff of society, things we always prop up our lives with? Insurance and finances and, and, and uh, you know, health and these things are good, but once those things are taken away, do you still have confidence? Is God bigger than it all. Is God bigger than life itself? And if he is, let's be a witness of that. The people can say, why are you so, you're so confident. Where does that come from? That's an opportunity to, to, to shine the light. You know, I got a, I got a big flashlight that is, 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 is really intense and I take it and to illuminate something. And, and so God can be illuminated in somebody's life through your witness, your witness of peace, your witness of confidence. Proverbs 3.26 says, The Lord will be 
your confidence. He is your confidence. You don't put your confidence there. He is your confidence. I love that. And then in Psalm 16, 8 says, I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be shaken. Mm. So where does that come from? Oh, let me tell you about it. Okay, that's who we are. We are a witness of peace. They, may, they meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. And do you know what? God works in and through everything. God's working in this virus. He's working through this virus, and it's giving an opportunity for, for people to, to acknowledge God for who he is. And he's first going to see it. They're going to see it in our life. So be a witness of peace, and then finally be a witness of love. Galatians 6.10 says, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially those who are of the household of faith. So let's check in with each other, okay? Throughout the weeks that are coming, I don't know exactly what's going to happen. Are we going to have a gathering next week? We'll have to see. I thought today was, was, was still appropriate, uh, but even if we don't, uh, let's stay in connection Remember, church is not an event. It's people. We belong to a family. There's interconnections throughout this room. Let's text each other. Let's check into each other. Create yourself a list of names of, of, of friends and family that are in this room and, and who are not in this room. We have about 90 people who call Generation Church home. Let, let, let's, let's, let's stay in touch. Let's stay in connection. Open up your home we can have ones and twos and threes and have these meetings and groups and stuff and we can we can a church happens best in those kinds of contexts so let's let's make sure we're checking in with each other and like i said check in with your neighbors people who might not be believers let's let's be a witness of love of care of concern uh, these times create ministry opportunities. Galatians says, uh, it, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone. And times like these create a lot of opportunities. So we're going to um, also think as a church, what can we do to make a difference? So does that mean, do we call schools and, and check with them? Uh, I, I know some people receive free meals at school. Maybe they need some assistance that way. I think that you know, last time we looked into that, that was covered. What else does the schools need? Do we, do we check somewhere else? Do we check in with apartment complex, complex managers or whatever? So again, like I said, out of this time of prayer, we're going to have some people come up and pray over s certain topics, but I want your wheels to be turning. All of our... All, of, all brains on board, right? All hands on deck. What can we do as a collective people to make a difference for our community? Okay? If you have ideals, let's talk. Don't keep those ideals to yourself. Because we, we do want to make a difference. The church has to be responsive. So we have a great opportunity to minister the love, peace, confidence, and the love of Jesus to our neighbors. So, so let's do that well. Um, so we're going to call upon the name of the Lord. Uh, again, we're going to have people come up, but please, you, from your seat, please pray. Uh, no need to hold hands or anything, anything like that, but let's just go vertical and let's, let's, uh, let's do some business with God. Deuteronomy 4 says this, Moses is boasting in the privilege that we have as God's people. He says, who is a people like us? who have a God so near as the Lord our God is to us wherever and whenever we call upon him. Do you know that God is near? He's not distant. He's not far. He's right in the mix of anything that's happening. He's right with us. And who is a people like us who have a God so near that when we call upon him, he does not answer? And then Psalm 145, 18 really says the same, say, same thing. The Lord is near to all who call upon his name. So, Adrian, why don't you give us uh, just a little music.
We're going to end with one song, but before we do that, let's, let's take some serious time. Prayer is powerful. It works. God acts. God moves on the behalf of his people, and when we call out to him, he does some special things as a result. Your prayers make a big difference. God wants to hear your voice. So as we enter into this time, oh, let's go vertical. Let's ask God to move on the sake of our families, our neighbors, our city, our state, our country. Let's lift up governing officials. They're trying to do their best to be servants of the public. Let's try to do the best we can to comply, to, to honor, to pray. <laughs> doesn't matter if they're Democrat, doesn't matter if they're Republican. Hey, this is time to band together as a people. And we're going to get through this. But we need to be a witness. We're not going to get through it with our horses and chariots. We're going to get through it because God is on our side. So we're going to pray for, for various things. We're going to pray for governing officials, we're going to pray for the vulnerable populations among us. I want to even pray for missionaries on the field. I want to pray for the church that we would have confidence in the Lord, that we'd have compassion for people. And I want to pray also for just an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. We need the Holy Spirit. If we don't feel desperation, it's times like these that kind of shake us up a little bit and make us a little bit more desperate. We get too comfortable. We get too confident in our own resources. We need the Holy Spirit in order for us to see the kinds of things God, God wants to do in our communities. So this is, this is an opportune time to uh, go to bat for our, for our country. So with that, let's see, who, who should we have first here? Um, Shanita, would you, would you come on up, girl? Mm. And as people pray, it's not just this person praying, okay? All of us. First, we're going to talk about, uh, we're going we're gonna to pray for the vulnerable populations. As you know, it's the elderly, those with underlying conditions. Uh, we want to make sure they're cared for, they're loved, and that God would have special mercy and favor. Uh, upon all vulnerable, whatever we can do to help, help, uh, help us know what we need to do, Lord. So, 